So our first speaker is Tom Parker. Um, Tom is a professor at San Francisco State University. He's in the Department of Biology. Tom, you want to take over the screen? Um, he got his uh, PhD in ecology at the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1977. He's an ecologist focused on the ecology and evolution of vegetation dynamics, particularly studying manzanitas. His research has emphasized chaparral and tidal wetlands. Research questions concern seed dispersal, seed predation, seed, back, seed bank dynamics, seedling establishment, and the diffuse mutualisms associated with these various life stages, particularly the mycorrhizal fungi and scatter hoarding uh, rodents. Dr. Parker is also expert in the evolution taxonomy of manzanitas. He's worked on this genus for more than 25 years. He's the author of the book, Field Guide to Manzanitas, along with Mike Vasey, who will be speaking next, and Mike Hoffman. He's also the co-author of the Manzina section for the Jepson Manual and the Flora of North America. He's also a personal friend who's very warmly given of his time when he comes out on the mountain and his talents. And he's taught us a lot about Manzanitas. So Tom, why don't you take over and you're gonna be speaking about recent or ancient Bearberry begins to bear insight. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to uh, give this talk and be part of this conference on San Bruno Mountain. As you can see from the title, um, we're going to talk about one particular Arctostaphylus species, and that's uh, Bearberry or Arctostaphylus uva ursi. Um, but I want to emphasize that. San Bruno Mountain is home to a, a very large number of very interesting manzanitas, especially considering the small size of the, of the property, right? Um, one of the plants you can find there is Arctostaphylus monteriensis. It's a small population there. The big population is on Monterra Mountain in San Mateo County. One really large population is Arctostaphylus imbricata. Um, we're standing in the middle of a stand right there. It's that prostrate green uh, that you can see everywhere. And that's a, the kind of plant that draws a lot of attention from all the botanists who go up there or just any of the people interested in natural history. It's also a lovely plant. And if you get up really close at the right time, uh, you can see why it's a gorgeous plant. It has imbricate leaves that are clasping, so they have earlobes at the base that basically you know, encircle part of the stem. Yeah, that's why it uh, draws a lot of attention. Here are all of them. Um, the next speaker will go into uh, more of these, spe these species in particular. Um, so in addition to Monterensis and Imbricata, there's also a very small population of a plant called Pacifica. It's uh, only found near Pacific Rock. Um, a widespread species, Arctostaphylus crustacea, that has a burrow that re-sprouts, and Arctostaphylus uva ursi. And uva ursi is there in multiple forms. And uh, because of that, um, it has drawn a lot of attention and a lot of names from people. If you go to the top parking lot and walk the fire road a little bit, you'll see um, not only Imbricata on the side of the road there, but also uh, Arctostaphylus uva ursi. It dominates the area to the top and in a few other places. Um, one time, <laughs> we have a garbage truck in the background, I see. One time we were there and uh, PG&E was nice enough to uh, remove fuel to keep everything from um, burning. But this actually turned out to be of, of an advantage because we were able to find some pieces uh, that displays the, the variation that Arctostaphylus uva ursi can actually produce. So for example, if you look carefully, you can see that there is a swelling in the wood there. It's a little larger than a tennis ball. And that swelling is a burl and uh, it will re-sprout from all the multiple buds that are, com that are found in that um, expanded piece of wood. This is characteristic of uva ursi in a lot of different places. You can find uh, burls on uva ursi at Point Reyes. 
um, it's been reported from part of Canada and in other locations. Now this plant in particular was of interest to me, not just the form suborbiculata, but the fact that there are so many Uva Ursi on top of uh, San Bruno Mountain. It's a very unusual location for Uva Ursi as it's normally extremely coastal in California or at very, very high elevation. So this is a, a relic population of some sort. Um, the only other population south of San Bruno Mountain is on a bird rock offshore of Big Sur. So we're looking at the extreme southernmost location for Uva Ursi. And as a consequence, um, it has attracted my attention. And it's also quite lovely. To give you just a, a little bit of background, um, Arctostaphylus has a large, large number of species or taxa. Um, it's the most diverse woody plant of the western part of North America. As you can see, most of that diversity is right along the coast of California in, in the Mediterranean climate area. You're looking at everybody. There's not one species that isn't found within uh, this diagram. In the Mexico Basin and Range and Rocky Mountain area, it's really just three different species. There's a, one or two others that are close to California, but these are the common ones. Um, Arctostaphylus pungens called Mexican manzanita, which makes it into California and Arizona. Um, Arctostaphylus patula, which is very familiar in California if you go above the snow line, but it's also throughout uh, the West. And that one plant that we were talking about on San Bruno Mountain, Arctostaphylus uberci. So we, we see everything here. Um, but this doesn't cover the range uh, of all of the manzanitas of the world. And that's because we can go to Yellowstone and find Arctostaphylus uva ursi. We can go to Guatemala and find Arctostaphylus uva ursi, which is unusual. <laughs> Here it is in the Alps and above Timberline in Switzerland. You can even find it in Iceland and all sorts of places. In fact, the distribution of Arctostaphylus uva ursi is circumboreal and is found throughout uh, the northern hemisphere, either at high latitudes or at high elevations. It's pretty impressive. And that's what drew me to this, because all the other manzanitas are restricted to uh, the west coast or western part of North America. What is it about Uwe Ursi that's so different? Is it a really, really old uh, taxon that has had just lots of time to expand? Or is it a really new, new thing that has come up with a combination of traits that really just allowed it to explode uh, the range of manzanitas? So a little bit of background, a little bit of science. Um, Arctostaphylus has two uh, lineages in it that we call clades, the large and the little clade. And that just refers to the number of taxa that are found in each one. Um, but if, if you look at these uh, phylogenies, so these are basically um, ancestral trees that show you their relationships. You can see there's not a lot of branching. In fact, on the right side, you can see it looks more like a comb than it does a, a tree of relationships. And that's because we can't really uh, use uh, molecular data all the time to, to find those relationships if it's um, recent origin. But if we look at one of those trees in a little more detail, you can see that all the uva ursis from large numbers of places are at least a coherent group. So it's not like there's a lot of cryptic species or anything. Another scientist, uh, Dylan Burge, as part of a project I was involved in, um, did a, another simple phylogeny using what are called RADSeq data. And that's just where you take all the DNA, you chop it up, and then you randomly do some sequences. Uh, so you have a lot more information in it. And what you're finding is that Uva Ursi is, um, sits at the end of one of the tree branches, which suggests that it's a, a young 
uh, member of this lineage of Archistaphus. So that's kind of interesting because that also fits that last tree that Uva Ursi was separated from everybody else, have a little bit of difference, but this one kind of reassures that Uva Ursi is more modern. Now, more modern for this evolutionary history, we're not really sure what that means. It's just younger than its close relatives. Um, there are fossil records from the Point Reyes area that suggest it's at least one and a half million years old. So that puts it older than uh, humans, for example, <laughs> but it's still relatively young for this uh, particular lineage. Now, how does a young species become so much more widespread, though, than all of its relatives? So it has to have come up with a, a lot of new uh, physiological or ecological traits that have permitted that kind of expansion. If you go back to the distribution of Arctostaphylus uva ursi, we decided to investigate this by um, looking at a different part of the uh, genetics of the plant, and that's a spacer on the chloroplast gene. And, uh, this work was done by a graduate student, Kayla Sweeten. So all of those dots you see, the red and blue dots, uh, are sites where specimens uh, were collected that were used by Kayla to um, ex extract the chloroplast uh, genes. And these are the results. What a weird tree that you're looking at, right? Down at the bottom, some outgroups, a few members of the large clade, a few other members of the subfamily that Arctostaphylus is in. And then all the rest of those with the red stripe are members of the small clade, the little clade, uh, but there are about 34 individuals of Arctostaphylus uva ursi in there. And this doesn't look very readable at this point, so let's change it to where you can see what's going on. At the top end, if you start with uh, uva ursi at the top, you can see that it's the uh, youngest, most recently derived member of the small clade. Um, below it is Aloniana numularia, good coastal species. Uh, Stanfordiana, Hispidula, Densiflora, uh, other good coastal species of uh, Northern California. And then below them, Pungens and Patula, which are both uh, those widespread species that we saw on the map earlier. Below that set of uh, relationships are two other groups, Uva Ursi completely uh, dominating one uh, clade, and Uva Ursi dominating another clade that also includes a few members of Patula and one pungence. Now this doesn't look very interpretable, except that everything to the top with the red stripe um, adjacent to it, represents all the members of the small clade, plus um, collections that were found in the northern part of the uh, hemisphere, our hemisphere, and the eastern part of North America. Everything with that uh, blue stripe adjacent to it represents collections from Western North America. So we're, we're looking at some differences. This is basically what you would expect. This is what we were expecting. A nice sequential relationship suggesting the sequence of origin of what these species are like. This is not what we were expecting. This was a very confusing little piece, but it is interpretable. So it tells us though that Archistaphylus uva ursi has a very complicated history, evolutionary and ecological history. The differences in the sequences suggest that it has multiple chloroplasts. What does that mean? That means it is captured chloroplast by some ancestral hybridization a long time ago that links it to older members of its uh, lineage, but that are very widespread, um, Arctostaphylus patula and pungens, so the, the green leaf and the Mexican manzanita. Now, if we go back, the colors of those dots reflect um, the western and the northern and eastern uh, clusters of Uva Ursi that we were showing you in that phylogenetic tree. Okay. 
Now, we, unfortunately, we don't have anything from Siberia. We weren't able to locate any specimens from Herbaria. So we're not really sure what's going on there. But if you look at Europe, you can see that there are both red and blue dots. Um, so both of those lineages have been able to in, invade Eurasia. So the red individuals were those found in the phylogeny where you would predict Uversi would be the most recent member of that little clade. But those blue individuals were the ones that had those different chloroplasts the, that are linked to the much older and widespread Arctostaphylos pungens and Arctostaphylos patula. If we go back, now you can sort of make a different kind of interpretation. All of this up at the top is Arctostaphylos uva ursi plus some European uh, collections. Um, this is the lineage that looks like it's supposed to be, where its chloroplasts are just a few gene or a few alleles different from all its other close relatives. Down here, this particular lineage is all European specimens of this separate group with a different kind of chloroplast. This group are all West Coast members of Arctostaphylos uva ursi. And this bottom group is Arctostaphylos uva ursi collections from the Rocky Mountains or the Basin and Range. So you can see there is a geographical structure uh, to this phylogeny. And that's good because that means we can make some interpretations of the history of this group. One is that there is a common ancestor between the European members of the um, blue individuals, if you will. And that common ancestor connects all of those European, Eurasian members to all of the members of the Uva Ursi that are found on what we now found on the west coast of the United States um, and into British Columbia. Below that, there is another common ancestor that links all of those individuals to the Rocky Mountain and Basin and Range cluster. So what we're seeing is there was some ancestral hybridization event where Uva Ursi was able to capture chloroplasts, um, probably by a hybridization with Patula and then back crossing to Uva Ursi, recombining traits and uh, taking off after that. So we're still left with the fact that it has a very complicated history, that there are multiple chloroplasts and it is linked to these older uh, lineages. So what does this mean? This means Arctostaphylos uva ursi is a fantastic and very exciting individual species that has a wonderful evolutionary history that uh, is, just creates incredible insights. If you think about the fact that these things are over a million years old, and that means they've gone through um, a lot of climatic shifts in North America. We've had multiple glacial epochs, things moving to the south during the glacial periods, recovering and moving back north in the interglacials, retreating again during the next glacial, and coming back north again. That gives us some kind of explanation for why we have Uva Ursi all the way down in Guatemala, and currently Uva Ursi all the way around the globe in the circumboreal. You can see why we sometimes think of Manzanitas as being a chaotic group to work with because they are filled with mystery and Uva Ursi is one of the most amazing ones to be filled with mystery. So how did Uva Ursi increase its range? So that chloroplast tree gives us a little bit of insight. We know the origin was likely um, Western North America. There wasn't much of California 15 10, 15 million years ago, a series of volcanic islands and some uplifted mountains. Uh, so it was mostly in Nevada that uh, fossils of Arctostaphylos are found. So if we give the origin somewhere there, it's one of the more recent parts of the little clay, then those members 
took off, began to dominate the northern parts of North America, and probably crossed via the Atlantic and possibly through the Bering Straits as well. And that's how those red individuals were able to get it to Eurasia. But we know that the West Coast members of Uva Ursi were also prominent in Europe. And so the blue individuals being related to that West Coast lineage suggests that their invasion happened via the Bering Straits. So that makes the, um, the prediction that should we ever find individuals in Siberia that we can access, then we should find lots of members of the blue and possibly some members of the red lineage. So where does that leave us again, back with this pretty impressive uh, plant? And I focus on this species because San Bruno Mountain does have that uh, impressive variation of Arctostaphylus uh, The The populations at the top of the mountain are coarse with mostly elliptic leaves, which is not typical for Uber Ursi throughout the world, um, but very, very similar to plants from Guatemala that Mike Basie was able to collect. And it also has uh, suborbiculata, which is pretty similar to more widespread uh, forms of, of bearberry. And it has other variations as well. So, what do we have with Arctostaphylus uva ursi then? It's not of ancient origin. It appears to be of recent origin. It appears to be one of the most recent um, derivations from that little clade. That doesn't mean it's just a few thousand years old. It means it's, it could be pretty old nonetheless, but it's a relatively recent origin. Somehow it's been able to create trait combinations that has allowed a massive range expansion. It is not restricted to the Mediterranean area, obviously, like most of the other species. It seems to have taken traits from the coastal group and traits from the basin and range group and uh, with that combination been able to create a, a taxon that can invade cold uh, snowy areas. It's pretty impressive. It is old enough to have relic populations in Guatemala. And it appears to have two lineages, one that is what you would predict um, sequentially from close relatives, having chloroplasts that are similar, but it has another lineage that has captured chloroplasts from other taxa. It appears that both lineages have invaded Eurasia during all the movements of glacial epochs. And it appears that one lineage dominates the northern and eastern part of North America, while the other dominates the west coast, the basin and range in the Rocky Mountains. There was an article um, 40, 30 years ago that talked about an unusual location in uh, part of the northern uh, Rocky Mountains. And that's an area where both of these lineages um, meet. And this particular study was looking at um, ploidy levels and found that the Uber Ursi in that location not only had mostly diploids, but it also had a lot of tetraploids. And that of the individuals that they sampled, one was a triploid, one was a pentaploid, and one was a hexaploid. It was like there was some kind of genetic issue in the population. It's possible that that stand happened to have lineages or members from both of these chloroplast lineages, and that they had been separated long enough that they had genetic problems. And what's a solution to a genetic problem in a hybrid? You just change your ploidy levels, and that's gives you a stable hybrid at that point. Be interesting to see if they have the, that kind of variation in chloroplasts at that site. So to summarize what this unusual group is like, 
If you think about all the Manzanitas in the western part of the United States, um, they have split into two lineages, of which we have both on San Bruno Mountain, a little in the large clay. Large clay just went on and took off in mostly the California floristic province, and that just means northern Baja to southern Oregon, uh, the areas with uh, Mediterranean climate um, where it's most, mostly dry, although the maritime area has got the largest number of taxa. One species, Arctostaphylus columbianus, slipped out of California and made it all the way to British Columbia. But for the most part, this group with a huge number of taxa is restricted to the California floristic province. A little clade diversified as well, and Uva Ursi eventually evolved. Most of the little clade ended up in the California floristic province uh, along the coast. So you have things like uh, Arctostaphylus rudis down in Santa Barbara County. And in our area, we've got Arctostaphylus hookeri, Uva Ursi, Sensitiva, Numularia, to the north of us, Stanfordiana, Densiflora. So all of those restricted to the west coast to some extent. Three of the taxa from the little clade, though, did not retreat, and that's Pungens, Patula, and Uva Ursi. They expanded their ranges and went into the basin and range, the Rocky Mountains, Mexico. And we know that ancestrally, Uva Ursi separated pretty early into two lineages, one of which expanded north and east and eventually made it into Eurasia, and one of which had some kind of ancestral hybridization event that gave it totally different chloroplasts. And that one was also able to expand, but mostly in the West Coast, basin and range areas, and also invaded Eurasia. That leads us back to San Bruno Mountain and the fact that we have a diverse array of manzanitas there, some of which are completely restricted. And in the case of Uva Ursi, the variation that you find is just indicative of a really cool uh, evolutionary history and just makes San Bruno Mountain one of those very special conservation places. Um, there are lots of other stories similar that you could find on San Bruno Mountain, but this is the one I wanted to present because it's so unusual. So thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Tom. That was amazing. Um, there's so much that's going on in uh, Manzanita research that the rest of us don't know. That was a wonderful beginning to let us know what's happening. Um, 